It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. How you doing, everybody? This is Phil Ferguson, and I am delighted that you are here. In case you missed it, um, I guess about a week ago, I was on the Atheist Experience um, with the uh, uh, Atheist Community of Austin, and thank you, everybody, who uh, helped out on that. It's one of those things that on that show, I get to just show up. <laughs> I'm the talent uh, but I don't really do any work. I mean, other than talking to people. And it looks like the good chunk of the reviews are quite positive, And I thank those people. And I'm glad that you like my appearances and my style. And of course, there's people that uh, just loathe the way I talk to people. So, you know, you can't, you can't win them all. It is something that is definitely a possibility that I can seem condescending, rude, blunt, and honestly, in the situation for that show, I could totally see that. I, I can see that I am not the nicest, smoothest orator when it comes to talking to people that have, I don't know, crazy ideas. I've just done this for too long, the uh, atheist activist thing. I've done it for too long to, uh, I don't know, just to, to let, <laughs> let the crazy go by. Uh, one caller was... Uh, going to prove uh, the accuracy of the Bible and the existence of God with, with math. And he started off by saying, uh, if you look at Exodus, no, not Exodus, Revelations. If you look at Revelations uh, uh, and then in the book of James and then Muhammad, and, I, and I, I can't, I can't, I'm sorry. I Maybe, maybe my reaction should have been, you're a troll. You're, you're obviously someone who doesn't believe this stuff and you're trying to make Christians look bad. But I, I don't know. It's hard to know on the fly when someone calls in that I didn't screen and I haven't talked to and I haven't met. Uh, you kind of take them at their word for it and, and see what happens. There was a couple wonderful callers, so I thank them for that. Uh, and, and it's one of those things that I find this activity uh, enjoyable in a part, but also very <laughs> emotionally I don't know, psychologically draining, physically draining. Um, and after the show and after thinking about what happened and what, what was talked about, I don't know, this part of me gets this profound sadness that we, we still have these discussions. The, the idea that the vast majority of the American population thinks that their religion is a good idea, that Christianity is a good idea. And, and maybe... Maybe the really nice people just don't call a show like that. Maybe the people that can properly explain uh, Christianity don't call a show like that. So so it could be this horrific selection bias. And I don't think that's the case, honestly. But anyway, so that was fun. So go check it out. Uh, any uh, constructive criticism is welcome. If you just want to retort that I'm an asshole, I know that already. You don't have to tell me. It's cool. I'm, I'm fine. Um, so that was good. Uh, coming up, of course, I have a, a trip to Atlanta, Georgia in, in uh, less than a month now for Easter for the American Atheist Convention. I hope I can see you there. I've got a couple other trips that are possibly in the works. So is there? there is a possibility that, of course, while I generally don't get the show out weekly, that there might be a bigger gap when I take a little time for myself to go somewhere. I'll let you know after it happens because I don't want to jinx anything. No, I don't really believe in jinxing, but I'm just saying, um, you know, we can talk about that after it's over. So got a lot going on. And in today's show, and maybe I should have said this earlier, but whatever, I've got another segment on the Department of Labor rule follow-up. 
that may be painfully boring because you've heard about it before. There's some new information that I have learned that's included in that segment. I got a quick update on my electric bill and the solar panels and electric cars and what it costs to drive an electric car. And um, I've seen videos where people are like, well, I don't mind paying $5 for a gallon for gasoline because electricity costs as much. No, it doesn't. No, it fucking doesn't. And I'm going to go over that in that segment. Another segment on another investment opportunity, another website with a pretty app, Masterworks, where you can invest in multi-million dollar paintings with just a few thousand dollars. A little old you can invest like the rich folk and you'll never be able to guess what my opinion of this thing is, but I go through the details of at least of what I know and how it works. And we will have another installment of super shitty funds. And so hopefully you will enjoy the vast majority of all of the content. You can, of course, recommend the show to your friends, bring in new listeners. You can go to Apple Podcasts and give a five-star review or Stitcher. And uh, I, I guess that's it for now. So let's take a quick little break and, and get on with the show. I just wanted to give a little follow-up update on uh, the Department of Labor rule for prohibited transactions. Talked about it a lot. My apologies. It's just, you know, when things change, especially when there's a big change in the rules and or the laws, uh, it's going to get mentioned a couple of times. And it gets mentioned probably more because as I learn things, I want to share them with you, even if it may not specifically affect you. But a lot of people have retirement plans. And the first thing that you need to know, and I think I'm still fine tuning the response I'm going to give to people, is that a 401k and 403b and often a TSP are a type of retirement plan called, that are, are covered by regulations from um, a law called ERISA. I even had to go look up what what the name why it's called ERISA. I mean, I just know that it's ERISA at this point in time, but uh, it is a uh, act from Congress in 1974 called the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And it put the Department and La Department of Labor kind of sort of in charge of a whole bunch of different types of accounts. Some of those accounts are, but are not limited to 401k, 403b, 457, deferred comp, uh, TSP, thrift savings plan, often run, oh, not often, run by the government uh, and usually usually through your job. Um, this also can include pension plans, defined benefit, defined contribution, but almost any type of plan covered by your employment. employment. And so the Department of Labor has involvement with that and have had that for almost 50 years is that wow that's a long time almost 50 years so the new ruling that they made was that specifically if an advisor gives uh, a recommendation that you move your ERISA account usually most of the time that's movable only after you have a separation event meaning you quit got fired laid off whatever you're no longer working for your former employer uh, the advisor cannot recommend that you move that money to an IRA that the advisor then gets paid on. It is called a prohibited transaction. And when they use the word prohibited, I'm interpreting at this point in time, it is illegal. It's just flat out not allowed. The extra nuance that I've taken and the extra steps that I've taken to provide more protection for me, and maybe I'm overreacting, and I would be delighted if that's the case. Uh, at first I said, I'm, I can't recommend to anybody that you do it. Well, uh, according to the webinar that I watched, uh, recommending that you don't do it or not recommending that you do it could be seen by the Department of Labor as advice and their concern is not that you do or don't recommend it, but that you document what you did or didn't recommend. And that was the uh, where there's this exemption thing comes in, exception thing comes in. This, these eight different factors that have to be in place 
for me to, I don't know, document that there's an exempt exception. And it's, again, according to me, in my in my opinion, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hassle. And I'm not really confident in the exact right way to do it yet. And so my strategy initially was just to tell people I can't recommend that you roll over your IRA. But now I have to take an even broader stance because there's also the potential problem if someone calls me and says, hey, Phil, what do you think of my 401k? By the way, I'm not a client and I'm not retiring and I'm not moving anything. And they ask me for information and then I give them free information. Then a year later they get fired and they say, well, now I want to move it over to you because you've been very helpful when you weren't getting paid. Now I want to move it over to you. Did I suggest to them at some point in the past during prior conversations that if they change their job, they should move it over? And how do I document that? And even if I didn't do that, I have to document that I didn't do it. And I still have to do those eight different things uh, for you to move the money over so that I can get paid. And I also have the luxury where my business is big enough, I can make enough to get by uh, without having to have a lot of rollover accounts come my way that I have suggested or not suggested. So the current way I'm phrasing it is that due to new Department of Labor regulations involving ERISA accounts, I will not review or provide any guidance or opinions of any kind whatsoever on a 401k or any other type of ERISA qualified account. I'm not gonna look at it. I'm not gonna suggest this fund over that fund. I'm not gonna do shit for you. And it breaks my fucking heart, but I think that's the line for now that I need to take. If you are a client and want to send me what you have in your 401k, you may do that. Now, I just had an email from a listener that said, well, what advice can you give? What how much help can you provide if I want to roll over 401k? They don't have one to roll over now. And basically my response is that I can't really go over anything specific in reference to your 401k, what's in it and what you should do with it. I'm going to completely avoid the entire fucking subject, specifically when it comes to a client, potential client, listener, something like that. Now, the one carve out that I'm still allowing myself to do, and this has been very specifically clarified by the Department of Labor, is that I can talk about how shit works in the industry. So if you have a 401k, a 403b, or many other types of accounts at your work, when you separate, when you no longer work there, they're no longer your employer, you have the legal opportunity I think yeah, the regulations and everything allow you to roll over your money into an IRA. Now, if you have a Roth 401k, you would be allowed to roll it into a Roth IRA, just to be clear. So that's something you can do. And that's something that I can talk about because those are the rules. It's something you could do. Whether it's a good idea for you or not, I have no fucking clue. And I'm not going to have a fucking clue because I'm not going to look at your situation a la the previous seven minutes of this conversation. But if you leave your job and if you want to roll over your 401k, usually all you have to do is tell your former employer or the custodian, the company that holds the 401k or the TSP or whatever for your benefit. And you tell them, I want to roll over to an IRA and or a Roth IRA and your former employer or the custodian for the 401k will send you a form. The vast majority of time, this form is one page, maybe two. Every once in a while, a company sends me one or sends, well, used to send me one, used to send their employer one that would be 12 or 15 pages. And that was just somehow somebody's getting paid by the word to write that fucking document. Because all the former employer needs or all the custodian that's working with the former employer needs, generally speaking, is your name, your address, your social security number, your date of birth, the uh, account number, the account number for the IRA and or Roth IRA where you are rolling the money over to, and they need to know where the account is held. So you generally want to have the IRA or the Roth IRA set up before you ask for the rollover. You can go to any place you want 
I'm not going to give you a, a, a direction on where you can go, but you can go to any brokerage firm, any mutual fund company, any name that you know, and you can go set up an IRA and or a Roth IRA and then contact your employer. They'll give you the form to fill out. You put all that information on the form. And then the part that seems archaic, but 95, 98% of the time, the company, the custodian, the former custodian, uh, or the employer, well, not, not the employer, the custodian, the person holding your money, will send a check to you. So let's say, for example, you set up an account at Vanguard. The check would say Vanguard FBO for the benefit of John Smith, just to make up a name, John Smith. Technically, that check is not made to John Smith. It's made to Vanguard for the benefit of John Smith. So if you're John Smith and you just got this uh, check, the check is not to you. You cannot cash it. You cannot sign it. You shouldn't sign it. I recommend to people that they would make a photocopy of the document and then forward it in this theoretical scenario to Vanguard where you've already set up your IRA or Roth IRA and boom, you put the cash in and then you do whatever you want to do with it. If you want to hire an advisor, that's cool. If you want to hire a broker, that's cool. If you want to go to Edward Jones, that's cool. Uh, but th that's basically how you do it in some limited cases, and this used to not even exist before, but in the last few years, some custodians might send the money directly and cut you out of the loop. That's perfectly fine. I don't know why they, why it got started. The, the industry norm was to send a check and it can be very weird to just get in the regular mail and you open it up on a random day and there's your check for a million dollars from the custodian that had your account at your former employer. And you're like, oh my God, I can't, I'm not going to put a million dollar check in the mail, nor should you. Um, but I think you should send it uh, signature required, overnight delivery, that kind of thing. It's maybe going to cost you 20, 25 bucks. I don't even know what that costs nowadays, but um, pay the fucking money to make sure the check goes where you want it to go and that it gets there right away. I mean, if it's $5,000, whatever, put it, put it in a regular mail if you want, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. I'm going to pay for the super special magical overnight with signature required kind of delivery thing. So there's that. And then once that check is cashed by the new custodian that holds your IRA or Roth IRA, you can invest it in whatever you want. I can still recommend that the average person should have index funds. So you could do that once it's there. But that's the process from a general standpoint, not specific to any listener or client or future client on how one in the industry does a rollover of their 401k. It's actually quite simple. Anyone can do it. Um, and the only thing that the custodian will have to do after you fill out the form is they may go to your former employer and have them sign off that you are indeed a former employee employer, employee, that you're the former employee, they're the former employer. They, they'll check that. Uh, so that might take a few extra days. But um, like I said, it's kind of spooky to get the big check and that you forward it on. But that's how you do a 401k rollover. So that's not specific to anybody. I'm not giving anybody any advice whatsoever in this little end of this commentary here. But that's what someone can do with a ERISA type plan that you have at work. So I, I hope that helps. Oh, um, one other thing I wanted to say, if you go to a different advisor or an insurance company or a brokerage firm, they may uh, be perfectly happy to give you advice and make very specific recommendations. And they may have you fill out a form or a couple of forms to uh, make it clear that that's what they're doing. I am not saying that that's not allowed. I'm saying I am choosing to not do that. So in case someone goes, but Phil, I went and talked to this guy at this other company and they said they can do it. Cool. They can do it. I'm happy for them and maybe even happy for you if you get some assistance. But to roll over uh, a work plan is actually quite easy. Uh, of course, if anyone ha already has an IRA set up at TD Ameritrade and rolls their money over to it, uh, I had nothing to do with it. I didn't provide an opinion. I didn't say you should or you shouldn't. I may not even know in, in advance that the money's showing up. 
that makes it perfectly clear that I had nothing to do with it. So if you send me an email, like if you're a client and you send me an email and say, Phil, what should I do with this 401k from the job I just left? I'm going to give you an email that's going to maybe seem a little uh, direct and blunt that uh, I can't help you. I'm choosing not to help you. I won't review your 401k. Uh, I won't provide you any guidance or opinions on what you should do with your 401k. So save yourself a step. And like I said before, I'm heartbroken because this is a very important part of, uh, of what I do. I, I want to help people, but the regulations have me, at least me, spooked enough to uh, avoid doing it for a while. Hey, that's enough. We'll do something else now. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. Section 11. Inspiration. Not before about the 3rd century was it claimed or believed that the books composing the New Testament were inspired. It will be remembered that there were a great number of books, of gospels, epistles, and acts, and that from these the inspired ones were selected by uninspired men. Between the fathers there were great differences of opinion as to which books were inspired, much discussion, and plenty of hatred. Many of the books now deemed spurious were, by many of the fathers, regarded as divine, and some now regarded as inspired were believed to be spurious. Many of the early Christians and some of the fathers repudiated the Gospel of John, the Epistle to the Hebrews, Jude, James, Peter, and the Revelation of St. John. On the other hand, many of them regarded the Gospel of the Hebrews, of the Egyptians, the preaching of Peter, the shepherd of Hermas, the epistle of Barnabas, the pastor of Hermas, the revelation of Peter, the revelation of Paul, the epistle of Clement, the gospel of Nicodemus, inspired books equal to the very best. From all these books, and many others, the Christians selected the inspired ones. The men who did the selecting were ignorant and superstitious. They were firm believers in the miraculous, they thought that diseases had been cured by the aprons and handkerchiefs of the apostles, by the bones of the dead. They believed in the fable of the phoenix, and that the hyenas changed their sex every year. Were the men who through many centuries made the selections inspired? Were they ignorant, credulous, stupid, and malicious, as well qualified to judge of inspiration as the students of our time? How are we bound by their opinion? Have we not the right to judge for ourselves? Erasmus, one of the leaders of the Reformation, declared that the epistle to the Hebrews was not written by Paul, and he denied the inspiration of Second and Third John and also a revelation. Luther was of the same opinion. He declared James to be an epistle of straw and denied the inspiration of revelation. Zwinglius rejected the book of Revelation, and even Calvin denied that Paul was the author of Hebrews. The truth is, that the Protestants did not agree as to what books are inspired until 1647 by the Assembly of Westminster. To prove that a book is inspired, you must prove the existence of God. You must also prove that this God thinks, acts, has objects, ends, and aims. This is somewhat difficult. It is impossible to conceive of an infinite being. Having no conception of an infinite being, it is impossible to tell whether all the facts we know tend to prove or disprove the existence of such a being. God is a guess. If the existence of God is admitted, how are we to prove that he inspired the writers of the books of the Bible? How can one man establish the inspiration of another? How can an inspired man prove that he is inspired? How can he know himself that he is inspired? There is no way to prove the fact of inspiration. The only evidence is the word of some man who could by no possibility know anything on the subject. What is inspiration? Did God use men as instruments? Did he cause them to write his thoughts? Did he take possession of their minds and destroy their wills? Were these writers only partly controlled so that their mistakes, their ignorance, and their prejudices were mingled with the wisdom of God? 
How are we to separate the mistakes of man from the thoughts of God? Can we do this without being inspired ourselves? If the original writers were inspired, then the translator should have been, and so should be the men who tell us what the Bible means. How is it possible for a human being to know that he is inspired by an infinite being? But of one thing we may be certain— An inspired book should certainly excel all the books produced by uninspired men. It should, above all, be true, filled with wisdom, blossoming in beauty, perfect. Ministers wonder how I can be wicked enough to attack the Bible. I will tell them, this book, the Bible, has persecuted even unto death the wisest and the best— This book stayed and stopped the onward movement of the human race. This book poisoned the fountains of learning and misdirected the energies of man. This book is the enemy of freedom, the support of slavery. This book sowed the seeds of hatred in families and nations, fed the flames of war, and impoverished the world. This book is the breastwork of kings and tyrants, the enslaver of women and children. This book has corrupted parliaments and courts, This book has made colleges and universities the teachers of error and the haters of science. This book has filled Christendom with hateful, cruel, ignorant, and warring sects. This book taught men to kill their fellows for religion's sake. This book funded the Inquisition, invented the instruments of torture, built the dungeons in which the good and loving languished, forged the chains that rusted in their flesh, erected the scaffolds whereon they died— This book piled faggots about the feet of the just. This book drove reason from the minds of millions and filled the asylums with the insane. This book has caused fathers and mothers to shed the blood of their babes. This book was the auction block on which the slave mother stood when she was sold from her child. This book filled the sails of the slave trader and made merchandise of human flesh. This book lighted the fires that burned witches and wizards— This book filled the darkness with ghouls and ghosts, and the bodies of men and women with devils. This book polluted the souls of men with the infamous dogma of eternal pain. This book made credulity the greatest of virtues, and investigation the greatest of crimes. This book filled nations with hermits, monks, and nuns, with the pious and the useless. This book placed the ignorant and unclean saint above the philosopher and philanthropist, This book taught men to despise the joys of this life that he might be happy in another, to waste this world for the sake of the next. I attack this book because it is the enemy of human liberty, the greatest obstruction across the highway of human progress. Let me ask the ministers one question. How can you be wicked enough to defend this book? You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. I've got a little electricity update. Solar panels, electricity from the company, electric car kind of stuff. Uh, Just got my new bill. You can hear it there. And the uh, total for my electricity, this is from February 9th to March 10th. Just just for fun, right? We're just going to compare this. My electric bill was $91. And I was thinking... Wow, that that seems high. So I I was digging it because I have solar panels, right? I I expect smaller electric bills because I have smaller uh, solar panels. So I went and looked, and last year the bill with was sixty five dollars, and that was with solar panels. Um, but the previous year was one hundred and thirty dollars without solar panels. So went from one hundred and thirty to sixty five. So I saved sixty five. But then this year it was ninety. $91. And I'm thinking, how did it go up from 65 to 91 Well, it looks like there's two big factors. And of course, I'm guessing because this shit's complicated. Listen to this. We've got uh, electricity supply charge, transmission services charge, purchased electricity adjustment, what, what, whatever that is. And that varies from month to month wildly. Two things that are pretty close to fixed customer charge and standard metering charge but they change from time to time i i don't know why um let's see distribution facility charge 
Illinois Electric Distribution Charge, um, and then of course my current bill, net metering credit from delivery. That's what I'm delivering to them. So they, they did pay me some money back for that. And then there's a, a half a dozen taxes. Who knows what they're for? But uh, end result was $90. And I started looking at the usage. So for the past four or five years in this month, February into the first week of March, as a household, we use about 1,100 kilowatt hours. Now, if you know much about kilowatt hours and electricity for the average house, that's way above the average. The average house for this time of the year in the United States is probably six to 800 kilowatts, and I'm over 1,100. Uh, I work at home. I'm home all day. We're more likely to run the heat, even though it's gas heat. It's got the blower motor. I've got filters going because I've got some allergies, and uh, running the filters, honestly, is way cheaper than getting shots uh, for things to fight the allergies, which I probably won't enjoy anyway. But this month, for whatever reason, uh, is 200 kilowatts more than any of the last three years of electricity usage. And I was racking my head to try to figure out how and how that happened. Well, I figured it out. We're trying to be much more careful in using electricity to drive than gasoline to drive. So uh, I have an electric car, 100% electric, but I don't drive that much working from home and not being able to go anywhere. And my wife drives the RAV4 Prime, which, you know, first 40 miles, give or take in the cold, maybe 50 in perfect weather is on electricity. But then after that, it's gas. Well, she's been trying, and I thank her for it, very diligently on trips that uh, you know, don't require a bigger car. She's been taking the Bolt, the electric car. And so we've been putting more electricity into the electric car because, and I'm just going to side story here for the uh, cost just as an example my electricity currently apparently according to this new bill best i can guess is about 14 cents a kilowatt hour um, interestingly four years ago it was 10 to 11 cents per kilowatt hour so that that has gone up that's that's great uh it's a little sarcasm there but even at the higher price of 14 cents a kilowatt hour if you have a relatively efficient electric car. Now, a Hummer EV or other big, heavy, heavier, bigger electric cars aren't going to get the same efficiency. So it's just like, you know, with gasoline powered cars, if you drive a Ford Focus, you're going to do better than a Yukon. So, you know, we just, we get that. But the cost for us in electricity at 14 cents per kilowatt hour to drive the Bolt EV, relatively quite high efficiency, uh, is about a dollar five in electricity to go 30 miles. So a car like that, a relatively small, if it used a gallon of gasoline, might get 30 miles per gallon, might get a little bit more. I don't know. Um, if I compare it to uh, 40 miles, it'd be about a dollar 40. So, uh, you know, just a little bit over a dollar to drive 30 to 40 miles where gas is three to four to some places over five recently. And it looks like it's coming down a little. So I'm glad to hear about that. But just in case you hear anywhere that uh, it costs $5 to uh, power uh, an electric car, $5 electricity. No, it doesn't. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you live somewhere where the electricity is wickedly expensive. Maybe. And, and just for laughs, I'm going to put in here what you might pay at a, uh, a high-speed charger along the interstate and I've come up with I'm just assuming 40 cents per kilowatt hour instead of the 14 I pay at home uh, in that case you might pay three to four dollars for the electricity to drive 30 to 40 miles so even in that case it's cheaper than gas and and the, the joke I often tell people is that the five to ten percent of electricity that I use all on really long distance drives is less than gas, but the 90 to 95% of electricity I use from my house is about one, one dollar, one fourth the price of gas. So overall, wickedly more uh, affordable to drive electricity. Anyway, back to the home bill. So it's $91 and 
uh, after I went through the documents here and I figured out what the uh, the current rate is and extrapolated that to what we actually used without the solar panels my bill would have not been ninety one dollars but about a hundred and sixty dollars so I did save almost seventy dollars and that's nice that's seventy dollars of course seventy dollars a month is gonna take a long time to pay for your solar panels but it's just one month so I went and uh, looked back at uh, last year's some of last year's bills and the two smallest dollar bills uh, were uh, surprisingly May and June not June and July May and June uh, when solar panels get hot their efficiency falls so the solar panels actually produce more energy in May than July and the solstice should be the peak of course around June 21st so you'd think July would be more effective than June than May uh, but it's not because it gets hotter. But the May and, and June bills uh, were about $10, $15 last year instead of close to $200 um, if I had uh, not uh, had the solar panels. So it, it adds up and it still averages out to about, I don't know, $150, $160 a month for the year, uh, something close to that. So it's uh, saving a good chunk of money. The, the offset, of course, is we're using more electricity because of the electric cars, but I'm using a total of more electricity, but I'm buying less electricity. Uh, so the other thing that this kicks into mind is that with even just a modest solar panel installation, uh, and I'm thinking after allowances and rebates and credits, maybe four or $5,000, you could have an electric car and effectively not use any more electricity from the grid. So when people talk about how we don't have enough electricity to power cars. Here's another way around that. For just a, a 5,000 maybe per house, uh, you could power one car and not use net more electricity from the grid. This is not that complicated. Uh, we, we can do those things. So that's just a, a quick little update and some thoughts on the solar panels, the electric cars, electric prices, my utility bill. And if you have any questions about that, you can, of course, email me phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com and we'll take another little break here. Section 12, The Real Bible. For thousands of years, men have been writing the real Bible and it is being written from day to day and it will never be finished while man has life. All the facts that we know all the truly recorded events, all the discoveries and inventions, all the wonderful machines whose wheels and levers seem to think, all the poems, crystals from the brain, flowers from the heart, all the songs of love and joy, of smiles and tears, the great dramas of imagination's world, the wondrous paintings, miracles of form and color, of light and shade, the marvelous marbles that seem to live and breathe, the secrets told by rock and star, by dust and flower, by rain and snow, by frost and flame, by winding stream and desert sand, by mountain range and billowed sea. All the wisdom that lengthens and ennobles life, all that avoids or cures disease or conquers pain, all just and perfect laws and rules that guide and shape our lives, all thoughts that feed the flames of love, the music that transfigures, enraptures, and enthralls the victories of heart and brain, the miracles that hands have wrought, the deft and cunning hands of those who worked for wife and child, the histories of noble deeds, of brave and useful men, of faithful loving wives, of quenchless mother love, of conflicts for the right, of sufferings for the truth, of all the best that all the men and women of the world have said and thought and done through all the years. These treasures of the heart and brain, these are the sacred scriptures of the human race. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions.
just got an idea from a listener via email, and he will know who he is. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, they sent a question about an investment opportunity called Masterworks, where you can have a uh, a new type of investment that's not tied to stocks or bonds or cash. Um, I'm guessing that's mostly true, although, you know, I, I do see uh, the graphs are kind of correlated. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but the nice thing is it's not stocks. It's not bonds. It's art. And they have this little chart here from 1995, which is a delightful surprise. And they actually started before uh, the stock market went up in the dot-com era in the late 90s. So that's that's refreshing and different. They show that the S&P 500 since then has gone up 9.5% per year, uh, including dividends. I'm pretty sure that's, uh, that's just about right. Let me look here at Wikipedia S&P 500. At year end of 2021, the S&P 500 is up 9.76 per year over the last 25 years. And that's the time frame that they used here. So that's, you know, we, we could argue one way or the other, but it's 25 year data, give or take. It's it's fairly accurate representation of what the S&P 500 did. And then they have here uh, that contemporary art, whatever the fuck that is is up 14% per year. And then there's an asterisk. And uh, let's see, the footnote says, reflects value-weighted price appreciation for all contemporary art produced after 1945, sold at least twice at public auction. There are significant differences between art investments and stocks. Masterworks does not offer securities that directly correlate to contemporary art. I did not ex see that end coming. You know, it's one of those videos, wait for it. Um, Masterworks does not offer securities directly correlated to contemporary art. So why in the fuck do you show me in really big bold letters that I can make 14% per year or that contemporary art did go up 14% per year. So they're using this reference point. Um, and of course in the footnote, that's not what they do. So they don't claim to do that. So why the fuck show me that it made 14%. Also, it's very interesting, very, very tricksky worded. Um, and I don't know if the average person looking at this is going to pick this up. Reflects value weighted price appreciation. So if there's one or two pieces of art that went up thousands of percent, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 percent, that could mean uh, that those handful of pieces of art, the ones that were sold twice at public auction, as is further clarified in this footnote, uh, they drag up the entire market. So you could own dozens or hundreds of pieces of art and still lose money because you didn't own the couple of pieces of art that went up a lot because it's value weighted. So that's got a lot of room for error and confusion and it doesn't even matter because that's not what you're investing in per the footnote. So um, that's kind of funky. Uh, let's see here. They have uh, other comments. Attractive historical price appreciation of, of what? What has attractive historical price appreciation? The contemporary art number that you said doesn't apply and that's not what you do. I, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, you can invest in multi-million dollar paintings. Yeah, whatever. Uh, buy and potentially buy and potentially sell shares on the secondary market. Buy and potentially share sell shares on the secondary market. So now I'm very concerned about how, how do you get out? You give them the money and they invest in some art. Uh, we have no idea what you're going to make. I don't trust this track record because they said it doesn't apply to what they're doing anyway. Uh, receive proceeds if and when paintings sell. So you're going to give them money and they're going to buy art or in this case paintings. And if and when they ever sell some, they might distribute some of the proceeds to you. And if you want your money out earlier, you might be able to sell your shares on the secondary market. 
Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Another section here featured in New York Times, New York Magazine, CNN, Forbes, and CNBC. Does that mean that they bought an ad or that they talked to producers for money and got a segment on a quote unquote news segment? I, I do not know. I continue. Just This is just the, the homepage, I think. Yeah. 15.8% um, annualized track record. Annualized historical offering weighted offering weighted performance. Net of fees from inception through December 31st, 2021. So this is their actual track record, I, I think. Um, that's cool. 15%, 15.8% sounds like a lot through December 31st, 2021. Oh, look, calculation methodology. Let's open a new tab. Oh, I, I have gotten pretty good feedback in the past, but if you guys don't like me doing this kind of on the fly as I go through to walk through my thought process and things I look for, let me know. Uh, of course, if you like it, let me know. I always like to hear that. Uh, so there's all kinds of details here. A general appraisal methodology. Um... So appraisal methodology, I guess these things have to be appraised because they're not not sold. Oh, here's a Masterworks track record. Let me take a look at this. Oh, okay, yeah, so that's kind of what I was getting from above. It, here, here's a sentence. Masterworks track record, in quotes, reflects Masterworks internal estimate of the performance of the overall Masterworks portfolio. So they're guessing how much the things that they have bought went up. So there's no way to value exactly a piece of art until it's sold. Because when it's sold at a public auction, that's the value because that's what it's sold for. So they're guessing. <laughs> they're guessing uh, how much the things that they've bought have gone up without, I mean, above they gave some criteria that they kind of sort of use, but you know, it's kind of one of those things, a uh, fox watching the hen house the guys telling you how great they are are the ones telling you how great they are by giving you the numbers that they've decided that reflect how great they are. I don't like that. I don't like that a whole lot. Uh, also, this uh, track record is from September 27th of 2019. So you have 21, 20, and a couple of months of 19. So they've only been around for two years and a few months. And two years and a few months to have this uh, almost 16% return if I look at the three-year performance for the S&P 500, and this is this is something very important. All, on a regular basis, especially when the market's up a lot, I will talk to somebody about an investment that they have, uh, whether it's with another advisor or at a broker in their company plan, and they'll say something like, oh man, I, I'm really happy. My, my portfolio over the last three years, of all U.S. stocks is up 15%. Uh, and I know the long-term average is 10 and 15, way bigger than 10. So I'm crushing it. Why would I change to do something that you do, Phil? Well, here's the thing that you need to look at. You need to compare your portfolio to what the indexes did. To So I'm going to keep it simple. They're just the basic S&P 500, which is not the entire U.S. stock market. It's not international stocks. It's not real estate. It's not bonds. It's not cash overly simplified investment idea, but it, it simplifies the discussion. For the three years ending 1231 of 2021, the S&P 500 is on a tear, up 26.03% per year for the last three years. 26.03. So this fund of art that makes up their own value to tell you how good they are, gives you the impression because of the big graphic above showing you that the stock market has made 9.5% for 25 years. And then they give you a short-term number to show that they've made 16%, but the S&P 500 made 26%. So you lost 10% a year. And the same thing in your 401k. If you look at a, uh, a diversified stock mutual fund that in your portfolio inside your 401k or inside your brokerage account that has made 15% per year for the last three years, that's awesome when you compare it to 10, but you need to compare it to what actually happened. In the last three years, what actually happened in the S&P 500 is 26% per year. Now, we can talk about whether that's reasonable or not, but when the market was paying big gains, had, had big gains, appreciation, high appreciation, you missed out. 
you only made 15, not 26. And so this Masterworks thing is promoting this idea that they made 16% per year when during the approximate relative period, the market went up 26% per year. So dramatic underperformance while showing you numbers that look like dramatic overperformance. Very clever. Now, as I scroll down, here's another headline. I'm not going to read the, the paragraph, but it says, investors should not unduly rely on performance data. Uh, I think that's correct, but this is one of those cover your ass things. We we showed you all these magical numbers in a way that makes it look like we're fantastic, but then there's this footnote that says, oh, don't rely on the past performance data, which very common thing to do, not a big deal. Uh, important limitations on usefulness of appraisals, a couple of paragraphs on that. Potential conflicts of interest, uh, excellent stuff there. Um, let's see, here's a tab that says how it works, investing in art, some nice videos, testimonials, glossy comments, puffery, exaggeration. Um, we buy the best examples at attractive prices. Yeah, so I, I, without digging in, I, I don't know exactly what they own. Uh, oh, oh, here's uh, management fees, 1.5% per year. Our annual management fee is paid in the form of equity. So they don't pay themselves in uh, art. <laughs> <laughs> they want the cash. They want the cash that you gave up to invest in art, but they want the cash. Uh, management fees uh, cover professional storage, insurance, administrative costs, regulatory filings, annual appraisals. Um, let's see. Then there's a thing here. 20% future profits were aligned with investors' interest to sell the paintings for the highest attainable price. Huh. Isn't that kind of inherent? When you own something, you want to sell it for the highest possible price. And why? Why 20%? 20% future promises? 20% future profits? Is that uh, is that a promise? No, I don't think it's a promise. I, I think it's just a fucking random number. 20% future profits. It doesn't say 20% per year. And that's always another thing to look at. Uh, if you have someone pitching you an investment and they say you can make 20%, and they might even say, 20, 25% or even 20% guaranteed, um, which I don't know how they can do that, but they don't tell you over what time frame. So it might be that they promise you no matter what to pay you 20% uh, back that you're going to make 20%, but 10 years from now, which means you made 2%, actually less than 2% per year compounded. But even if they fulfill it and they do pay you 20% more than you put in, you lost all the opportunity cost of, of things that you could um, do with that money. So anyway, I'm not going to dig too much into this because I'm not going to fucking buy it. And I'm going to suggest that you don't fucking buy it. But it's very curious. And it's one of those things that when you see really heavily advertised investments, um, basically my, my thought process on that is someone who's got a really good investment is not going to chase you very hard because they don't have to. So the ones that are on TV all the time, and they're spending a fortune to try to bring in new suckers. All right, clients, investors, um, that, that should be the red flag right off the beginning. Um, anyway, so that's some thoughts on an investment, quote unquote investment that you could make with Masterworks. Good luck on that one. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Well, I didn't have it planned, here is another fan favorite segment, Super Shitty Fund. I think I've talked about this fund before, but they just sent me a new email and just uh, just kind of pissed me off. It, so it has this, it says, stocks are down, bonds are down, purchasing power is down, this fund is up. And I thought, really? Really, this fund is up? year to date, late February of 2022. Well, it's easy enough to go check. So I pop over here to Morningstar and I click on this tab that says performance and I put in this fund, uh, America First Income, AFPIX. And it says year to date, minus 2.6. Huh. In the very first couple of words is a bold faced lie. Why, why do that? Why do something so obvious? Why not just keep pretending like you have something good to offer 
Why make a definitive declarative statement that is so trivially falsifiable that it's embarrassing? I mean, come on, you can do better than this. But now that I'm here looking at this fund, I figured I'd look around a little bit and tell you some of the other fun features of this fund. It's claim to fame, or at least they think its yield is 7.82. Uh, I think the email, did it say 7.83? Yes, yeah, it said 7.83. Morning starts with 7.82, whatever. Uh, again, th that's not yield. That's the payout. So the payout can cut into the gains. And, you know, if that's what you want, that's fine. But it's not something you should expect that you put in $100,000 and they're going to hand you 7% every year and you keep making $100,000. Um, this fund, I'm going to the portfolio again on Morningstar.com. It's a 64% US stock and 32% uh, income. It doesn't say anything about international stuff. 4% uh, cash on hand. And let's see, how has it done in the long run? It has done... Um, 10-year average return is 2.7%, and the average return for large cap value, which is this, the stocks are uh, clustered in large cap value, uh, the Vanguard large cap value fund is up 13.7% per year for the last 10 years. Now, I have no expectation that we're going to continue to get that performance, but it also means this fund <laughs> won't get that performance. So, when the market or the large cap value was returning 13.74%, they made 2.7. So they are a good 10, 11, yeah, 11, yeah, 11 percentage points behind per year. Now, clearly part of that is due to the fact that they're paying out almost 8%. The other part is that the expense ratio in this bad boy is 1.81%. The other thing that I found fantastically interesting at the Morningstar website, the turnover is 677%. So whatever it is that they're doing, they're changing their mind six, seven, eight times per calendar year. That's absolutely staggering. Is why do they trade that much? Do their good ideas become shitty ideas? I, I don't know. It, it's... Uh, it's one of those things where the possibility is that the expense ratio of 1.8% is not enough money for them. So they pay themselves fees and, uh, yeah, I guess fees to do the trading. So they might have another part of the business um, that does the trading because trading costs aren't included in the expense ratio, just in case you didn't know. Uh, so there's they're making more money on top of the 1.8. So it's not just 1.8. So... It's not too much of a surprise to think 1.8 plus the 8 they pay out is 10%. And maybe they're costing the owners another whole percent for uh, the transaction costs. So they're clearing 3% per year out of your pocket on this. Now, if you have normal stock returns of 10%, if this continues to underperform by 11% per year, uh, the fund not unsurprisingly, when it's paying out 8%, is going to go down in value every year. So just something that kind of struck my interest because in the email it said that the fund is up. It is not up. So what is that? That's the third line of the email is false. So I thought I would share it with you. Another super shitty fund. <laughs> Well, here it is. You've wasted a perfectly good hour that you could have watched paint dry, and instead you've hung out with all of us and listened to this show. Again, I do hope you found value in it, and you can go give a five-star review. You cannot become a patron anymore. I've got that turned off, and I don't think I've even posted a show there for a while, so hopefully there's still no patrons left. If someone is producing content that you like, and they're, uh, they're not me, they're other than me, consider going to something like Patron and becoming a Patreon and throwing a few bucks in their direction. Um, uh, unlike what I mentioned at the very beginning, being on the Atheist Experience where I just show up and, and sit there and talk, which is quite easy for me, uh, this show actually takes some work. 
Um, a really easy show might be two to four hours of work. Sometimes there's something I do more research on and or I interview people and every once in a while a more complicated or detailed or mathematically inclined segment might be eight or 10 hours of work. Other people are spending even more time making quality podcasts and videos. And of course, you don't have to go just to the handful of people that you already know. Check out for new stuff because more voices create more opportunity for us to educate people on how the world actually works and how things are going. So fingers crossed that you can do that and go help somebody out. And I'm going to just wrap up. And like I said at the very beginning, I am going to be at the American Atheist Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And I hope to see you there. Please feel free to come up and say hello. I'd be delighted to meet you or re-meet you uh, since I haven't done a whole lot of anything as far as the conferences go for over two years. So I'm looking uh, very forward to that. So until then, ciao. Ciao.